Well, we come to an, another day. We, uh, we all woke up this morning, which is a huge blessing. Um, did you stop and think, what, what, what is today? The Sabbath. Um, and what is the Sabbath? Okay, day of rest. Uh, what, what else? Saturday. It's Saturday. Good, all right. Um, it's, it's a day in which rep, rep, it represents and remembers all the way back to creation. Uh, after God labored and worked and he, 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 he brought everything into, uh, into being, he stopped. Um, I guess that's as much as if it's possible for God to, to rest because he doesn't need to. He doesn't get tired. But he stopped just so that you and I would learn to stop and to be still. How hard is it for you to, to stop for even five minutes, much less a day? And yet when you stop, isn't it a blessing? And so he gives us this gift. It's, it, it's not a, a, an obligation in the sense of um, it's, it's piling upon us. No, it, it's, a, it's a blessing to be able to stop and to think about him. Amen? Well, we look at, uh, through, the, uh, through the Tanakh, the, we, it's often, the, ter- often termed the Old Testament. Um, we like to, to really um, focus on the fact that um, the Tanakh, which uh, stands for Torah, and then what's next? What's that? Mm-hmm. Yep. Which is the Nevaim, the prophets. And then the K in the Tanakh is, represents what? The Ketuvim, the writings. And so it represents all the different books uh, in, that we have in what we commonly call the Old Testament. But this is the foundation. Uh, it's not old in the sense of um, not, not useful anymore. It's, it's old in the sense of it's been around a long time. Um, it's ancient and it's beautiful. And the foundation is what everything else rests upon. Amen? Um, the New Testament, New Covenant, would not have anything to stand upon if it did not rest upon what God had done previously. Um, when you build uh, a building, you don't, put, you don't build the roof first, right? Um, well, you, maybe you do, but you don't, you don't put the roof on, onto the, a, a big piece of ground. Can you imagine a big open space of ground and there's a roof there? How useful is that? It's not useful at all. What do you need in order to support the roof? Walls. Walls, but before you even do that. Foundation. And what's a good foundation? Concrete. Um, if, you, if you could find a big enough rock, and, and they're out there, you build a foundation or a structure on something that's solid. What happens if you build it uh, upon uh, Oklahoma red clay? It's going to sink or wash away. Um, so you build something on a strong foundation so that it lasts. And here's why, and why God's word in the, in the written form has endured to this very day. Because our Jewish people have tenaciously held to the scriptures. They have said to, to foreign kings and to um, government officials, uh, even to the point of, of dying for it, but we will not forsake our God. And so to this very day, they very meticulously keep track of, of every letter um, and, and every little piece that, that goes into um, a, a Torah scroll and, and all the scriptures. And so we have to be grateful that they have, as it is said in the scriptures, they, they've held the oracles of God and, and due to this very day. Well, the new covenant is that which rests upon the work that God has done. And so he is, again, showing us beautiful things in what we would call the Tanakh. Uh, and so this house is named after our father David, uh, who um, set up a very simple uh, tent to be able to honor something very great. And what was the, the, the tent of David? What did it, did it honor? The Ark. Hey, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the representation of, of the very throne of God. Um, and it was a very simple, simple tent that, that, that honored something great. It's, it's a beautiful picture of you and me. Um, we're just dust held together by some water and maybe coffee right now. But we, like this simple tent, hold something great within us that's great, was greater than, than the Ark of the Covenant was ever. Um, we hold the presence of God, the Shekinah, within, and who sits upon the hearts of all who call upon him and live in him. Amen? So we see that our father David is a great and tremendous example. If you would please turn over to 2 Samuel, chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23, um, at a certain point in uh, the rule of of King David, um, he did what what many kings, if not most kings, 
and wise generals do, he, he decided to take a census. What is a census? Okay. He want, and what is it that he wanted to count? Okay. And even more so than that in this particular case. And not just the men, but those that could hold a sword and fight. He wanted to know where his army was, right? Um, in, in Israel today, uh, it is uh, mandatory that you, if you um, are born and or an, an Israeli, Israeli citizen uh, and, you're, and you grow up at a certain age, you're obligated to do what? To serve in the military. So you, you're, 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 there's no draft. It's just expected. You're a citizen of Israel. You're going to serve in uh, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. So it's, it, it's how a country functions. Because, I mean, no, there's very few countries that have ever existed for very long that didn't have a military force. Well, we see at this point in uh, King David's journey that he, he decides to take a census. And we'll begin uh, here in chapter 23. Um, I'm sorry, um, in, in the 24, actually, I'm, we're going to come back to 23. Uh, so in chapter 24, it says, Again, the, Lord, the anger of the Lord was roused uh, against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go and number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army, so he was a general, he was the highest ranking military officer, he says, uh, now go throughout all of the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and count the people that I may know uh, the number of the people. And Joab said to the king, now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times more than they are. And may the eyes of my Lord the king see it. But why does my Lord the king desire this thing? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab and he went uh, and against the captains of the army and therefore Joab and the captains of the army went out from the presence of the king to count the people of Israel. So what was Joab, the, again, the, the general of, 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 the, of the Israeli army, what was he telling the king? He shouldn't do it. I wonder why. Why would the, the general, who you would think would want to know how many army or how many people that would serve in his army, why wouldn't he want to know? Why? So the, the kings of Israel were, 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 were told to, to know, don't do this. But isn't it wise and prudent to want to know how many soldiers that you have at your disposal? Why, shouldn't, why should have, uh, have King David listened to his counselors in this place? Why shouldn't he have? Why should he have listened? And why didn't he? Okay, Roy? He should have humbled himself to know that God was speaking through Joab. Okay. So he should have said, you know, I, I don't need to know because it's not in these men who, who bring us victory. It, it's in what? It, it's in the Lord. It's in God. Okay, so hold your place there and pop back to, to chapter 23. <clears throat> And verse 1, it says, Now these were the last words of David. And thus says David, the son of Jesse, and thus the man raised up from on high, the anointed of the Lord, uh, uh, anointed of the God of, of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. The, rock, the God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God, and he should be like the light of the morning when the sun rises a morning without clouds, a tender grass springing out of the earth, by clear shining after rain, although my house is not so with God, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure, for this is my salvation and, and all of my desire. Will he not make it increase? But the sons of rebellion shall be, all be as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands." The man who touches them must be armed with iron, the shaft of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in that place. In this psalm, so to speak, David exalts God um, as, his, as his what? As his backup 
um, as his, um, his sidekick, his co-pilot? How, how is he acknowledging God? He's acknowledging God as the source of his salvation, as the source of his strength. Amen? Amen. And so, okay, now jump back to, to, to uh, chapter 24. So we, we see that all throughout his life, he constantly reached to God and said, you are my strength and my source and my, and my salvation. And yet, yet in a moment, perhaps a, a weakness of, of desiring to find comfort, um, he, he turned and looked towards earthly things and said, I need to know so I can be secure. Um, are you more secure when you know that the balance of your, check, uh, your checking account now or if you knew that you just won the lottery? If you just won $50 million. <laughs> How secure would you feel? That 50 mil, I, I can barely count over like, you know, a few thousand. How, how would you feel about life at that moment? You are the big winner, $50 million. I wouldn't foresee any financial problems in the near future. No. No, suddenly all your problems are solved, right? Because you just counted that 50 million in your, check, in your checking account. If it can actually fit in, I don't think it probably could fit in one to break it up and put in some offshore bank accounts. Point is, is you'd feel really, really secure. Why? Why would, why would that much money make you feel secure? You have more than enough. What else? No worries? But is it really? Would we really be secure if all of our problems were solved by being able to rely upon that source? Okay. okay. It, it, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't uh, sequential in, in order. Okay, because so. I was like, if those are my last words, and he's already said my house is in disarray, essentially, right. he's going to know, is there enough to fulfill God's promise, even though that's an earthly sure. um, thinking, to make sure that things stay the way they're supposed to, because his family may not work things out. Okay, perfectly, perfectly reasonable. Um, to, to want to know. Um, I think as we get closer um, to the time in which we depart this life, I think that our, our focus changes and we, we want to you know, make sure that everything is in order. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But God said to the kings, don't do what? Don't take a census. Don't take a census because you will begin to trust in earthly things and, 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 the, and the strength and the, and the might of, of, your, of your army. When we should be trusting in what? In God. So, it wasn't, it wasn't wrong necessarily that he wanted to know. It's just that he broke the commandment. In the sense of, it was, it's not wrong to want to know something. But if God says don't do it, we should do what? We should, we should obey him and not do it. It's, there's, a, it, there's a different, um, it, and we're, gonna, we're actually going to flip in just a second to um, Chronicles, which uh, tells roughly the same story. So basically, um, this particular one says that God incited him to do it, and then the next one says that, that Satan incited him. So which is true? They both are. And, and why would that be the case? And that's right. God uses the enemy for our perfection. Where Satan would love to kill, steal, and destroy, God utilizes him as a tool for our perfection, our salvation, growing us. No, I'm saying that, um, and, and, you're, and this is a great question, because this is, this is something that, that's confused people and, and oftentimes. Um, so, 
Who inflicted harm upon Job? By whose allowance? For what purpose? For God's will to be done, but, but for what? Okay, for, for Job to, to grow in his appreciation? Oh, um, that the suffering was for a purpose to grow Job in a greater reliance upon God and for the qualities of Job to be revealed. Did Messiah, when he, come, when he came, um, did he have an easy life? Was, was Messiah tested? Yes. Then why shouldn't we be tested? Um, Messiah was proven, was he not? Um, he didn't coast through floating in air, doing everything miraculously. He had to do what? He had to work. He, he had to walk through it. He had to, he had to go through it. Can you think of a time when Messiah w- was proven? There's actually multiple, but there's a particular series of events that I'm thinking of. Can you, can you think of a time in which he was proven? Wilderness the wilderness. Who was used in that wilderness experience to, to prove him? Satan. When? What, what, what did Satan do? Okay. Um, when he was at his most vulnerable. Yeah. He was proven through his relying upon his own strength. Who did Messiah rely upon? His father, God. He said, it, it is written. He didn't, he didn't come up with wisdom himself, per se. He drew from the source of, of all strength that God has given us through, through the words of the prophets up to that point. He said, it is written. He, he was proven and tested himself. And so how much... Would, would we be proven and tested as well? So, yes, God utilizes Satan to, to, to test us and to perfect us so that we can turn and give glory to God. Amen? So when, when we come back here where it, where it says that, that, um, that he incited David, David already had the weakness in him, just like you and I have our weaknesses. And Satan is the tool that, that is used to allow us to be able to come to the real life. Did David fail? So will you and I, as we do. We have to rise up like our father David did and repent and move forward and, and trust a little bit more today than we did yesterday. John? Um, going back to Job, Job confessed that that which he feared the most had come upon him. So, you know, on the day of that day, Job, I mean, Job may have had fear and that any kind of fear keep you from being as close to God as you should be because that fear is telling me that there's something there that I'm doubting as to whether God can, you know, help me out of here. Yes. And I'm living in constant fear. That's and Job right. admitted that that what I fear the most has come upon me. Yep. And after his experience, I don't think he no longer has that fear or any fear. Amen. Amen. Let's continue the story in verse, in verse 5. It says, and this is uh, uh, 2 Samuel 24 in verse 5. And they crossed over the Jordan and camped in um, uh, Aurora on the right side of the town, which, which is in the midst of the ravine of Gad towards Yazer. And they came to Gilead and the land of um, Tomtin Chodeshi. They came to, uh, wow, these are some fun names, aren't they? Dan, Ja'an, and around to Sidon. They came to the, uh, the stronghold of Tyre, to all the cities of the Hivites and Canaanites, and they went to south Judah as far as Beersheba. So that when they had gone through the land, they had come to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. 
Then Joab gave the sum of, uh, of the numbers of the people to the king, and there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. And David's heart uh, condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly. Um, uh, I've sinned greatly in, in what I have done. But now I pray you, O Lord, take away the iniquity from your servant, for I have done very foolishly. All right, we'll just jump over to uh, First Chronicles, chapter 21. We're literally jumping into the same story in a different portion of the scriptures. First Chronicles chapter 21. In verse 8, we're, just, we're going to backtrack to the verse that we just read. So, First Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 8. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I pray, pray, uh, I pray take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done foolishly. And the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, thus says the Lord. So Gad, who, who is Gad? Okay, so he, he was a prophet. That, that God spoke directly to. Um, and so he was, the, the, the seer or the prophet was to, was to speak to the king. Um, the king would inquire of the prophet of God um, to, to, to help him to be able to, to know what to do oftentimes. Who was another one of, of David's um, seers? Samuel. Hmm? Samuel. Samuel, yes, absolutely. And, and, and after Samuel? Nathan. Prophet Nathan, that's right. So the king always had a prophet to be able to help him to hear God. So we see that, and that's who, who Gad is in this particular uh, portion. Yes? I have a question. Mm-hmm. Why did they not use prophet instead of seer? Because when I read the word seer, I often think of the prophet that the Bible talks about, you know, like these mediums and things like that. So not a prophet, but a godly one, but an ungodly one. Why well, do they use seer? Seer is, is, a, is a, 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 a title or a function of a prophet. Um, what are some other things that the prophets do? They interpret. They interpret. What else? They see into the future. They give the messages to mm-hmm. whom God says to give it to. Okay, so, so they're, they're both messengers that, that, that bring a, an immediate word, but they're also sometimes those that are shown visions of, of a coming time, as we know the prophets do. So did the prophet Elijah... As far as we can tell, was he ever shown in the future? Think about his ministry. What did he do? What was his function? Did, did, did he, is there any of, of his, the words that are recorded from him that, that tell of, 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 a, of a coming time? Well, he ministered directly to the, to the hearts of the people at that moment. And what was his function primarily? Was it to see the future? No, he called the people to repentance, of which all the prophets ultimately have that, that as, as a focus, to come to repentance. But he didn't see the future. Uh, it wasn't given to him, or, or if it was, it's not recorded per se. Um, how about Daniel, another prophet? Was, was Daniel given visions of the future? Yes. Yeah, he was. Um, was Daniel uh, calling the, the people to repentance? Yeah, Absolutely. But so each prophet has a different function sometimes. But ultimately, all the prophets call humanity to repentance so, that, so they can what? Fellowship and commune with God. And this is the purpose of, of the prophets, is, is to call initially Israel and then ultimately all of humanity to fellowship. So we see that um, that, that is what's, what is taking place here. So he, he, um, Gad brings... Uh, a message from God. It says in verse 10, Go and tell David that thus I have said, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. So Gad said to David uh, and said to, or came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, choose for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you or for three days by the sword of the Lord, a plague in the land, with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territories of Israel. Consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. So what is God telling David now? He's, he, he's, he's telling 
um, because you have done this, because you have you've broken my commandment, um, there's a punishment. Um, do you think God loved David? Do you, do you think God desired to, 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 to kill people in Israel? He did. If the king can't obey, the people will follow suit. And it's why the responsibility of, of a king is so great. It's not just for his own sake or his own life, but for those that, that are under his care. You and I are our kings in training right now. We're called to live a holy life like our father David. We're kings. Where is the kingdom that we are responsible for? It's, it's within our hearts. Here's a, a little portion of Israel right, right within your own heart and my own heart. And you and I are reign over this place. How can we, what happens if, if you and I are disobedient? Does, d- does God punish us? You bet, he does. And, and if he disciplines us, it's because he loves us. You and I have a great responsibility of have, having have been given a, a very great gift by being a part of this kingdom of Israel. And the heart is this little portion that you and I have been given. Think about your role if you have children as a parent. Um, if you make a mistake, do your children suffer sometimes? Our, our decisions affect our families. Um, our choices affect people. Um, and so it's, it's important for us to, to awaken and continue to be awake so we understand that our lives impact other people. Because, again, we've been given a great gift by being a king in training. So it says he must make a choice of three things. Um, what's the first one? Three years of famine. That's huge. Thousands would die. Probably tens of thousands of people would die from lack of food. Or, he says, um, you can flee for three months with your enemies coming after you with a sword. And that could have been at that time, it could have been his, his family, you know, because some of his sons wanted to kill him. Or it, maybe it would have been the Philistines or somebody. But you can flee for three months. Or, for three days in which a plague comes upon the people and slays them. Those are some tough choices. Um, Can you imagine, what would you do if you were hearing those words? This is what I place before you. You choose. Ah, How can I save my skin, God? How can I get through this? We might reason. How can I minimize the damage to myself as little as possible? We might say to ourselves. In verse 13, David said to Gad, I am in such great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord. For his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hands of men. Where did he put his trust in that moment? Who is is punishing him? He said... I can't even begin to think or to make a judgment, Father, but I trust in you to bring me through this. I have sinned against God. And he said, do, do, do to me what is your will, God, but don't let me fall into the hands of men. And it says that the Lord sent a plague upon Israel. So that was option three. And 70,000 men of Israel fell. And God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord looked and relented of the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying, It is enough, now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth, having in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. And David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell on their faces. And David said to God, Was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who has sinned and done evil. Indeed, but these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, O my Lord, my God, be against me and my father's house. 
and against your people that they should be plagued. His decisions affected thousands and they died. Um, Our decisions affect untold numbers of people. We can either be agents of healing, hope, or we can be agents of destruction in hurting people with our words. Um, our, somebody hurts us and we rise up in, in this maliciousness. We want to get even. It, it, it's in our nature. It's, it's in the serpent's venom, which runs through, our, through, through our, our, our veins sometimes. But we have to push out the venom and, get, and continue the blood transfusion. Amen. From, from, from the one who has given his blood, creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. He says, don't do this to those people. You know, let, let, let it be upon me and my house. He knew that he had sinned. There was, um, there was a, something that had to occur. He said, I'm sorry, with his words, but what did he have to do to make it right? And do what? He had to offer a sacrifice. He sees this angel um, up over Jerusalem. I don't know if it was just a really big angel with, with a very large sword, or if, if the angel was, was, was above it and, it, and he could see this angel. I don't know, but whatever it was, it was terrifying. And the angel had, who had the sword over Jerusalem was, was the one who, who, had, who had taken the lives of, of those that, had, that, that, that God had judged. It was, a, it was a very terrifying thing, as we'll see in just a second. Um, this is the God, the same God who said, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden. This is the same God that met Moses in the wilderness. This is the same God who at the end of the book says, you know, um, you know come to me and find rest. Um, he says, this is the same God. It's not a different God. It's the same God. But God, is, is, who is a God of mercy, is also a God of justice. And he is a, he is a God that, that has, he, 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 he is both. Um, he's not wishy-washy. He, he is merciful. And sometimes mercy gets taken, it, it, mercy happens in ways that are difficult for us to understand. It says in verse 16, Therefore the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David, and David should go and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up at the word of Gad, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Ormond turned and saw the angel, and the four sons who were with him hid hid themselves, but Ornan continued threshing wheat. Interesting, huh? Um, Here is somebody who sees this this event happen, and he continues working, where his, his sons... They, they ran and hid themselves. Interesting. It's interesting. Just take note of that. In verse 21, so David came to um, Ornan, and Ornan looked and saw David. And he went from the threshing floor and bowed before David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar on it to the Lord. And you should grant it to me at the full price, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. But Ornan said to David, Take it yourself, and let my lord the king do what is good in, in his eyes. Look, I also give you the auction for burnt offerings, the threshing implements for wood, and the wheat for the grain offerings. I give it all. What did he just volunteer to do? What's that? He was willing to give up everything. What was that threshing floor for him? It was his livelihood. It was how he, he lived. It was how he, because he, 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 he would thresh the grain and he would sell it and he would eat some of it. And he was saying to the king who he, who he saw and ran to him and, and bowed down before the king. He, he said to the king, I'll give you everything, everything that you need. Take it. It's everything I have is yours. What a heart. What a, what a vision of, of, of a perfect servant of God who is willing to give up everything. Um, an example for you and for me, what is it that, that you value? Are you willing to give it up? Is, 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 is our pride worth so much that we would hold on to it? Or would we be able to give it up? As if God desires us to, to have our own pride. 
What is it that we would hold tightly to and not give to, to God? A beautiful example of a servant. I think we can see perhaps why he saw the angel and, and kept working. Because he, he trusted in God. And yet his, his sons, perhaps, that didn't have the same level of trust ran because they were afraid. A beautiful example of someone who is, has such great trust. King David could have said as the king, you know what, that's a good deal. Huh? I don't have to spend anything. He's just going to give me everything. I can like take care of that, and then I can, like, I've saved all this money that I can go buy more horses and better clothes. But David said, no, I, I won't accept you to give me this. In verse 24, it said, David said to Orm, um, Ornan, No, I will surely buy it for the full price, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which costs me nothing. So David said to Ornan, uh, gave to Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the place. It was a lot of money. I don't have an exact computation of, of it, but it was a lot of money that David gave to him. It says, that he built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of burnt offerings. And so the Lord commanded the angel and returned his sword to its sheath. And by the time that David had, uh, saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor uh, of Ornan the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of the Lord, the altar of the burnt offering which Moses had made in the wilderness, was at that time a high place in, in Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of the God, for he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. He, he sacrificed David. He gave, he gave a whole lot to be able to offer this, this offering back to God. Um, what are you and I willing to sacrifice for God so that we may be able to draw close to him? What is something that we could offer to God that we all possess? What's that? Ourselves, Ourselves? yes. What else? Time. Our time. It's something that every single one of us have on, on some level. It's something that you and I, no matter how much money we have, no matter how much or how little money we have, no matter what our, our station is, whatever that means anymore, we have something that we can give and offer to God to offer him, which is is our time. Um, I'm told there comes a time in which it's hard to get your children's attention. And sometimes you have to knock a lot and text a lot and call a lot. What is it that we can give to God? who desires our company. He desires to be with you and me, to be those that, that are seeking him. And all we have to do is, is be able to spend time with him. And that's the beautiful gift that every single one of us. God uses difficult things and circumstances so that we may come to see our sins and then do something about it. He desires for you and me to climb this, on this journey up the holy mountain. Huh. The events of your life that you're experiencing right now, and I, I look in, over here, I know most of you, I know certain challenges that you're having in your life. I have certain challenges in my life. We're all climbing this mountain. And God uses difficult things and circumstances to draw us closer to him. Amen? Amen. You see, for most people, their suffering and, and their struggles every day it's just suffering and struggles. But you and I are being perfected, are being drawn closer to God, or we're running away. And he desires for us to spend time with him. Um, what happens when you get close to the flame? And if I were to place my hand in here, which I'm not gonna do, and if I was strong enough, what would happen to my hand? I would take on the qualities of the flame but I'm, I'm, I'm of this earth and I would be consumed. But God is perfecting something in you and me. If I were to take a bar of gold 
and place the gold in the fire, what would happen to it? Probably not much. Definitely not. Gold, in, in, on this, it, 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 would, it wouldn't, wouldn't catch into flames, would it? it? It would take a whole lot before it became liquid. The gold of our lives is the holy things, the, the portions of our heart that have been perfected or are being perfected. The flame of God. What, is, what, is, what does the scripture say? That our God is a consuming fire. And to be in his presence we have to be becoming made gold and not hay and stubble and wax. And you see, this is our, our journey in life is, is slowly becoming gold so that we can be and withstand his presence and his glory. The prophet Moses says, you know, let me see your face. What did God say? Huh. I'll show you my backside. Huh. You can, bar- you can barely, ma- barely manage that. Uh, the, the prophet Elijah didn't see God. He just what? Experienced him through, through certain natural things which God caused. But he wants you and I to meet face to face and being perfected. We have a great responsibility. Will we be those that squander this kingdom that we've been given? King Saul Remember what, what the prophet uh, Samuel said to him at the very last thing? He said, no one has been given so much as to have treated it so, so, with so little care. No one has been given so much to have treated it with, with, with absolute disdain. He's saying to you and to me, I've given you a great gift. We see the little kingdom of our hearts and we're like, eh, it's not much but it's a beautiful start. And the time is coming when which the the structure that we have built within us will be revealed and the flame will test it. And will it be one that has been built out of of hay and stubble? Or will it be a structure that is built solid and of gold, withstanding that? On the day in which our lives are unrolled like scrolls, what we say, uh, well, I'm sure glad my life is not recorded like King David. And I'm grateful that it's not in a book that you all could flip open and read of my failings. But every one of us will stand before the the king, will we not? And the scrolls of our lives will be unrolled. What do you think is going to be found in those scrolls? Everything. Except what? What will not be found in those scrolls? What What we have repented of. Because he says that when we repent of something, it's as, as if what? He places it as far as east is from west. That's right. It doesn't exist anymore. Whereas our fathers and mothers, their, their sins are recorded for forever. We have a chance through our repentance to, to be washed away. There's still going to be a few things there, here and there. But we have a chance to stand before God with, with as little as possible. And there's going to be beautiful things written in that scroll of kindnesses and times when you took care of people and when you loved people that hated you and of times in which you didn't know if you were going to make it through but you pushed on through in faith and the record of your faithfulness will be recorded there as well. And here's again the beautiful time in which we have, all of us have given given a measure of time to spend in this life coming to our senses and repenting and then moving forward in faith. Amen. May you and I be those that don't just callously disregard the words of the scriptures, the teachings of the fathers, and the voice of the Spirit speaking to our hearts every day. But may we be those that are wise and listen and transform these hard hearts into beautiful gold. Amen. Father, we pray and ask that you would look upon us this Sabbath day and be kind to us and merciful to us. Father, if you could even break through a little bit of our hardness of heart and our our ears that are so tightly stopped up. To be able to get a word into us, uh, um, a vision into our hearts, uh, um, a a little glimmer of light to shine into these dark hearts so that we can draw close to you this day. Lord, may you be praised for eternity. Father, we, we ask that you would just continue this great and beautiful day that we have together. 
Father, that the sun is shining and the birds are singing. We have time together as brothers and sisters in, in Messiah. Lord, may you bless us as we bless you. We thank you for the great gift of life and your love and mercy. Amen.